grace to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for your kindness, for your mercy, for your grace that brought Jesus, God the Son, to earth as the God-man to indeed take our place and live the life we could not live and die the death we could not die, that we might be spared from your wrath for our sin, which we deserved, and also spared from the shame for our sin, because you say that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will not be put to shame. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So her life was a wreck. I mean, if anyone's life was a wreck, her life was a wreck. After five failed marriages, she stopped with the formalities, and she just started to live with her new boyfriend. She talked like it didn't bother her, like it didn't matter. But her actions betrayed her because she was living her life avoiding others because she was so ashamed of her own life, because she was so ashamed of the decisions that she had made And there was really nothing that she could do about those decisions. And that's why she came to the well for water in the middle of the day when the sun was blazing hot so that she could draw water alone. All the other women in the village drew water early in the morning and then later on in the evening. But she knew that she could not join the other women to do that so she did it when the sun was high when it was blazing hot when everybody else was gone so that she could hide from the looks so she wouldn't hear the comments wouldn't hear the whispers and not be reminded of the condemnation and shame she felt very deeply in her soul So the middle of the day when no one else came to draw water was her hiding place. That's where she hid. And her shame over her sin, which drove her to hide, drove her to hide from herself, drove her to hide from the people around her. But more importantly, it also caused her to try and hide from the one she could not hide from. And that was God. Until one day, God actually met her at the well in her hiding place. And he offered her a place to hide that would give her the protection that she really did need. Where her sin-wrecked life could be redeemed and her guilt could be removed and her shame finally destroyed. It was the place that we call the cross where Jesus, the just and the righteous, died for the unjust and the unrighteous so that we could have a hiding place to run to, so as to escape the punishment and the shame for our sin. You know, shame has has plagued human beings since Adam and Eve bit into that fruit and realized they were naked in Genesis chapter 3. Their first instinct when they did that was to hide from each other and to hide from God. And, and, and no wonder, because now for the first time in their existence, they are experiencing what it feels like to have actually sinned, to actually be guilty, and then to feel condemnation before God for their sin, and to feel a vulnerability before each other, and then to also hear the accusations of the accuser the very one who had tempted them into the sin, but like the double-crosser that he is, now laughed when they will live in the consequences of that sin forever. Just like he does today. Just like he's done in your lives. Just like he's done in my life. That double-crossing devil. But you know, that's not 
the way theirs or our story started. That's, that's not how it started. So I'd like you to go to Genesis 2.25. That's where we're going to be today. Genesis 2, verse 25. And we're going to start where theirs and our story began. So Genesis 2.25 is, is one of the most important statements in Scripture because it describes the condition of Adam and Eve as they stood before and lived with God in the Garden of Eden prior to disobeying him in Genesis 3. And here's what the verse says, Genesis 2.25, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So if you've been following with us as we've been working through Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, on our way to get all the way to Genesis 50 someday, someday, that's job security when you go as slow as I do, okay? That's job security. If you want to know the end of the story, you're going to have to keep me around for a while because you say, wow, we got a long ways to go to get to there. When I preached through Romans in one church, it took me two years just to get through Romans 6. I, th I think we'll go a little faster than that. There's just a lot there, you know. There's a lot there. I hate to skip any of it. So, so Adam and Eve have been created by God, and God has created this beautiful environment for them to live in. Beautiful place, which is a picture of, of the world that's to come for us as well. When the new Jerusalem, the garden, actually will come down, and you will be able to enjoy and experience that which God originally had for us, but which they lost for us. And again, we don't blame them for their sin because had you been Adam and you been Eve, had I been Adam, we would have done the same thing. And you say, how do you know? Because we've all done it. Haven't we all sinned? I don't think there's anyone in this room who has not disobeyed God, who has not been disobedient, who has not betrayed God, who has not denied God, who has not rebelled against God. So we would not have done any different. But before they disobeyed God, God gives us this description, a very short description of what it was like to live in his presence as people who had never sinned. And it's a very unusual description. He says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. So this verse is telling us what it was like for man and woman to be in the very presence of an all-holy, all-righteous, and all-glorious God as people who were fully known, fully exposed, and had nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. Absolutely nothing to hide. They were a complete open book. And, and some of us would say, oh, I, I only wish I could be an open book. I only wish I could be that vulnerable. I only wish that I could actually be known as I really am down deep by someone who loves me and would accept me knowing everything there is to know about me. Well, Adam and Eve were those people. Fully exposed, that's what the idea is behind the word naked. Fully exposed to God with nothing at all to hide. A complete open book. They're completely known inside and out. Living life completely before and in the presence of God. And this verse tells us that they were able to do this honestly. I mean, can you imagine what it would be to live life honestly? Now, I know there's, there's going to be some of you here today say, well, I'll live life honestly, and I'm going to beg to differ with you. I'm going to beg to differ with you. And if that gets you mad, I really don't care. Because I get my information from somebody else. I get it from the Lord who gives it to us through his word. We struggle with honesty. Every time someone asks you on the street as you're walking, hey, hey, how you doing? Most of us lie, don't we? And we do it for, for many kind of reasons. We, most of us, I, my problem is I just don't think anybody really cares. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> do you really care how I'm doing? And if you did, it, you wouldn't after you heard the first few lines. 
But it's very difficult to live an honest life when you have something to hide, isn't it? When you have things in your closet that you hope no one will ever find out about. Well, this woman at the well had some things in her closet. And she needed to be reminded of of something, a story that she also knew. She was aware of, of, of this story back in Genesis 2. And probably yearned for the day when she would be able to be seen without any sense of shame. When she would be able to be with people without any sense of awkwardness and fear or worry. When she would be able to to even live in the presence of God who is perfectly holy and can have nothing to do with sin. So anyway, back in Genesis 2.25, before the fall, that's the way it was. Before the fall in Genesis 3, before sin enters the human race, people were completely comfortable in God's presence. Completely comfortable. Completely at ease. But then in Genesis 3, the perfect shameless world of Genesis 2, where God and humans lived together in perfect harmony without sin and without guilt and without shame was destroyed and it disappeared. It disappeared. And so Genesis 2.25 is a bridge, if you will, between the world we were meant to live in and the world we are living in right now, where sin and guilt and shame are universal. And, and, And this verse is important because it points us to the cross. God put everything in these first, really, 12 chapters of Genesis that are going to then be fleshed out in the rest of the Bible. The first 12 chapters of Genesis are really going to give us all the pieces of the story that make the rest of the Bible make sense. And especially in these first three chapters. And so here's one of those pieces that he's going to give us in which he is wanting us to understand that this verse is going to drive us to the cross. And it's going to drive us to the cross where Jesus bore our sin and bore our guilt and bore our shame in order to give back to us this relationship with God and one day in the future, this long forgotten world in which we will once again be able to live in God's presence, fully exposed, completely known, with nothing to hide, no guilt, no shame. Because everything has been forgiven. So Genesis 2.25 is is giving us the picture of what life was like with God before sin. And what life will become like again because of Christ. Now the key word in Genesis 2.25 is the word naked. You probably had, had figured that already when you saw that word. It's the word naked. And the reason why it's the key word is is because it's used three more times in Genesis chapter 3. So whenever you're doing Bible study and you see a word that's repeated, or you see a phrase that's repeated, there's a reason why it's being repeated. Because God is trying to get our attention and say, wake up, this is important. And so the word naked is going to be used in Genesis 3 because that's going to be the condition now that man is going to be in because of sin. They're going to realize that they're naked, and there's something about their nakedness after they sin That is not good for them. So the Hebrew word is harom. It means to be exposed or to be made bare. And and while literally used of of physical nakedness, it, it has the idea of also being exposed and fully seen or known spiritually, known emotionally, and known mentally. So so it's not just talking about running around with your clothes off. It's describing that condition of being fully exposed inside and out so that everything about you is known to another, namely God. And so verse 25 is telling us that even though Adam and Eve were naked, fully exposed, fully known inside and out, they're not ashamed. And that's because there was nothing at this point in their existence for them to be ashamed of or ashamed about because they had not thought or felt or done anything wrong. They had not sinned. So you're going to start to see, what's the connection? The connection between sin and shame. There's a real connection there, isn't it? 
We feel shame when we have sinned unless you have hardened your heart so much to the point that you feel no shame. And that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. A very dangerous place to be. Listen, if you can commit a certain sin over and over and over again, and the shame becomes less and less and less, you're in a bad, bad place. And it would only be by the mercy and the grace of God that you could ever be rescued from that because you have hardened your conscience. You have hardened everything about you that could be sensitive to God. Your heart is, heart is as hard as a brick, and that's a bad place to be. So when you do feel shame over sin, that is good. That is a good thing. That is a good place to be. But even as believers, we need to learn how to deal with that shame, and that's where we're going to go in just a few minutes. The thing about Adam and Eve's nakedness is that they had not given being naked a second thought in the Garden of Eden. That was normal. Being fully exposed and fully known with, with nothing to hide was, was the norm. It never con- occurred to them that there was another way to live. It never occurred to them that they should be concerned about being fully exposed. Because, again, they had nothing to hide. Being fully exposed to God in every facet of their being and their existence was normal. And so it doesn't bother them in the least. But that all changes very quickly in Genesis 3 after they sin. Because once Adam and Eve sin for the very first time by disobeying God, being naked before God is all of a sudden a really big and scary deal. Sin changed everything. Now, we're not going to go piece by piece through Genesis 3 today. Just going to kind of overview the story so that we can still be focusing on verse 25 of chapter 2. And we'll be moving into Genesis 3 next Sunday. So once Adam and Eve sinned for the very first time by disobeying God, being naked is, is, is really a big and scary deal. And it's a really big and scary deal because now they know what evil is. They know what evil is now. Because they've just experienced evil, which is what sin is. And their former innocence has now been destroyed. It's similar to that feeling that overwhelms a person who has just committed a grave and serious life-changing sin. That they never ever thought they would ever involve themselves in for the first time and can only hope it was a bad dream that didn't happen. Have you ever been there? Have you ever woke up the next morning and you're just hoping that that was a nightmare and not reality? Hoping that that, that what you think happened did not happen? Or what you had just done that, 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 that maybe you just really didn't do what you had just done? And then you realize it did happen, and you did it, and life has now changed forever. That is what Adam and Eve felt that moment. Because now they are aware of something that human beings were never supposed to be made aware of. Sin. We see, Adam was warned by God. God said, the, the day that you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And, and, and the Hebrew actually has it this way, you will in dying die. In other words, you're going to start the process of dying the minute you disobey me. And that is going to ultimately lead to your death physically. So you're going to start dying. You're you're going to die spiritually. You're going to die physically. You're going to die in every which way. But like us, Adam and Eve ignored and neglected the warning. 
And now they find themselves in the consequences. Hoping it was a bad dream that really didn't happen, but it did happen. And not only have Adam and Eve done evil, the moment they did evil, they became evil. Now I know that you've got a lot of people today that say you don't want to tell people they're bad. Again, I've got another source here <laughs> that tells us that, no, that's not what you tell people. You know, we want to tell people, listen, you know, you, you're just a good person who's done bad things. No, the Bible says you're a bad person who's done bad things. And the sooner you, you, you deal with that, the sooner you come to realize that's true, the sooner you, you begin to reckon with that fact of what God says is true, the better it would be for all of us. We're not just a bunch of good people that have a problem doing bad things. The Bible says, no, we're a bunch of bad people that do bad things. And so that's why when when people ask, and I mentioned this once before, why do bad things happen to good people? And my answer to that question is, there are no good people. So your question is irrelevant. And, And some of you are saying, whoa. Listen, again, I just come back to the Word of God. Romans 3 tells us that there's no one righteous. No, not one. There's no one good. No, not one. There's no one who understands. No, not one. There's no one who seeks for God. No, not one. Which is why God had to send Jesus and rescue us because we could not rescue ourselves. And if there were good people, if there was such a thing, then it would have made no sense at all for Jesus to die on the cross. He died on the cross because we could not rescue ourselves. So Adam and Eve became sinners by sinning. We are their descendants. We are therefore born with a sin nature. So we sin because we are sinners. They started the chain, so they became a sinner by sinning. That's not what happens with you and I. We sin because we are born sinners. We have a sin nature in us. It comes with us through Adam and Eve. It has an automatic default mechanism that will always move toward disobedience and rebellion against God. And that's why God has to rescue us. So they've become sinners. And just as God warned them, they've died inside spiritually. They're now separated from God. They're experiencing guilt for the first time. They're experiencing an immense shame. As though enshrouded in a dark cloud, which is smothering the very life out of them. And it's too much for them. And so they now feeling intense and unrelenting shame. And you know, I mean, I felt it. I understand what's going on here. And if you, if you are human and you're breathing, you know what it is too, right? It's a smothering kind of thing that you can't escape. It's the byproduct of disobedience to God. So they try to deal with it by covering up their nakedness with fig leaves, which they sew together as makeshift clothing. And again, we're going to be dealing with all the specifics of this next week as we get into Genesis chapter 3. I'm just giving you the overview today. So so their first inclination after they have sinned and after they're now separated from God is not to run to God, it's to cover up. And it's to create their own means of covering up their nakedness. So it's a picture of what we do when we sin. When we sin, what do we try to do with our sin? Cover it up, right? Whatever way we can, we're going to cover it up. How did David cover up his adultery with Bathsheba that then produces a baby? How does he try to cover it up with her husband? Murder. Murder. And boy, that didn't do real well either, did it? It just gets worse and worse. Listen, whenever we're trying to cover up sin, we just make it worse. And so Adam and Eve's first inclination is, let's just cover it up. But you see, what they're trying to cover up is the shame they're feeling. And shame is not their problem. Sin is their problem. 
And so whenever we're trying to cover up our sin and trying to hide our sin and keep it from being exposed, we're dealing with the wrong thing. We're dealing with the shame, not the sin. The shame is the byproduct of the sin. You've got to deal with the sin if you're going to get rid of the shame. You can't just cover it up. It's never worked. It didn't work for them. It doesn't work for us. So they couldn't remove their shame for sin by merely trying to cover it up and make it go away. Shame is what we feel about ourselves after we've done something wrong, after we've sinned. Usually, the greater the sin, the greater the shame. I'm not telling anybody that anything we don't know, right? Sin is always the source of guilt and shame, always. And so if you're going to deal with the guilt and you're going to deal with the shame, you've got to deal with the sin, and that's the problem. We can't. We can't. We don't have the ability to do that. Someone else has to do that for us. And praise God, he did. So God has made us in such a way that sin always incurs guilt. And guilt generates shame so that when you violate God's laws, you're guilty and you feel that guilt as well as you feel ashamed of yourself for what you've done and now who you are in doing it. So guilt says to you, you sinned, you did wrong, you committed an evil act, you're guilty. And then shame says, because of what you've done, you're no good. That's what shame says. You're evil. You're worthless and you need to cover up and you need to hide the wicked, evil person that you are. So that's why the woman at the well is coming to get water at noon in the blazing sun because she's got to hide who she is. So this is probably a good time for us to ask ourselves, how do we hide our shame? How do we deal with our shame? For some, it's alcohol. Others, it's drugs. Others, it's materialism. I, I mean, how much do, do we really need anyway, right? For others, it's, it's running home and getting on the computer and getting on Amazon. Let's see what I can buy. Somebody walks into my office and they say, for you, it's books. I need those books. <laughs> Hunting rifles, crossbows, those kinds of things. Those things in and of themselves are not wrong, understand. But, but when we're using these kinds of things and, and, and all kinds of things to try to cover up shame, realize we're dealing with the wrong thing and we're certainly doing it the wrong way. So shame is smothering Adam and Eve with condemnation, with fear, with feelings of utter worthlessness and a sense that God is angry with them, which is why they're trying to hide their nakedness. And so the next thing they do is they just run away. They just run from God. God is in the garden, and they are running away from God. Sin and shame and guilt, unless God intervenes, will always push us away from God and cause us to run from God. Unless God intervenes. Which is what God does. Adam does not call out for God. God is calling out for Adam. You don't see Adam and Eve sinning and then running to God. They're running away from God. And had God not come after them in the garden, they would still be running. God comes after them. As we've been talking about, God is the one who initiates their rescue. They did not initiate their rescue. No one does. The Bible teaches us that over and over again. No one does. No one would. No one could. So God has to be the one that initiates the rescue. So in Genesis 3, 7, they're trying to hide from God. 
It says the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked. Now they know they're naked. Before, they, that was just normal. Now they know there's something wrong. They know they're naked. They're ashamed. They're guilty. So they sew these fig leaves together. They make themselves loin coverings. But then they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So interestingly enough, all those trees were created for them. God had told them in Genesis 2, every tree is yours. You enjoy the trees. You enjoy the fruit that comes from those trees. They were made for you. And so here's Adam and Eve hiding in the very things that God made for them to enjoy and to enjoy with him. And they're using those good things to hide from God. How many good things do we use to hide from God? It's not just bad things. Probably most of us, Utilize good things so that we can hide from God. Good things like maybe even serving in church so that we don't have to deal with a guilty conscience. Because we've got this idea, maybe I can just suppress my guilty conscience by my works and by my good deeds and by my service and by my availability and by my being in church every day of the week serving, preaching, singing, Playing is, I mean, don't please, if you're doing that, don't think I'm calling you out. I'm not. But I'm saying that it's possible. You know, the, the kind of people that worry me in church are not the people that, that kind, of, kind of have a, a guarded position. And they say, listen, I, I'm going to be involved, but that I need to kind of make sure that I look at things in my schedule and make sure I can really do this. But they don't worry me. You know who worries me? These are the people that always got to be doing it. Always. Jumping in for everything. Now, you say, why? That seems weird. No, because sometimes you can go overboard on all those good things, and there's a reason why. There's a reason why. And the first question that comes to my mind is, is, is what are you trying to hide here? What are you trying to compensate for? What are you trying to earn here? Because Adam and Eve are hiding among the good things that God created, not the bad things. Watch out for that. But, you know, it didn't work. It didn't work. Shame just didn't go away. It, it just won't go away. And so in verse 9, God rhetorically asks Adam, where are you? Where are you? To which Adam, in verse 10, does not answer with his location, but he answers with what? His condition. He doesn't tell God where he is geographically or pull out his GPS and tell him exactly where he's at in the garden. He answers with his condition. He says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Afraid. How did he even know what that meant? How did he even know what fear meant? He didn't until sin came. Now we've got fear. You got shame. You got guilt. You got fear. Do you see all the negative stuff is coming just from being disobedient to God? God said, if you do this in dying, you're going to die. You know, and if we were really honest with ourselves and, 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 and we were to, to give our testimony and, and really dig in and say, and, and this is me, probably most of us will have a story about that. How, how that sin that promised so much not only did not deliver, but it brought guilt and shame and fear like we have never, ever known in our lives. And if God had not rescued us, it would have destroyed us. Back in Genesis 2, Adam was in the presence of God and he heard God's voice and he never was afraid. He was never in dread of God. So, so what's changed? Well, Adam has changed because Adam has sinned and Adam is now afraid and he's really in dread of God because of his shame over his sin. And so now Adam and Eve are hopelessly enveloped in shame and unable to do anything about it because they're unable to do anything about their sin except run and hide from the only one who can help them, the only one who can save them. But, but this would not stop God from providing a way of escape for them. Their hiding and their running doesn't stop God. 
He's going to provide a way of escape. And this way of escape, the only way of escape that God was going to provide, the only way that God could provide for them to rescue them from their shame and from their guilt and from their fear and from their sin was for God himself to enter into their nakedness, into their shame and into their guilt by making their sin his own sin. That just doesn't sound right, does it? You know, every time I, I say that, I have to think back to all those verses that tell me that because it just doesn't seem right that God would make our sin his sin so that he could go to the cross and pay for that sin so that we could go free. But that's exactly what Jesus did for us. And if you've been following in the series, the Lord God, that is Yahweh Elohim, and, and, and what that, that name is referring back to is God the Son, who is the agent, the member of the Godhead, who is the creator, who creates in Genesis chapter 1. That's what John 1, 1 through 4 tells us. He's with them in Genesis chapter 2. He is here in his pre-incarnate state. He is always the mediator between God and man, always, even back in Genesis. He's walked with them through the garden. He's the one who is coming after them, just like he's going to do when the gospels start, who, is, who comes to earth to come to save man and women. It's Jesus. And so Jesus is going to be the one who's going to enter into their nakedness. And he entered into that nakedness at the cross. And don't miss this, because this is essential. How did he go to the cross? He wasn't wearing a loincloth like the movies like to depict. He went to the cross naked, fully exposed, fully naked. And that's important because that's why God uses the word so that he can tie Genesis 2.25 all the way into the gospel accounts of Jesus going to the cross and how he went to the cross and why he went to the cross because he went to the cross as our substitute so that he could be fully exposed on the cross, but he had nothing to be exposed for, did he? He hadn't done anything wrong. So he went to the cross to fully expose our sin before God so that God could punish it in Christ. And that's why he went to the cross naked. So when you look at a passage like John 19, verse 23, turn there very quickly, John 19, 23. You know, the good thing about this COVID virus thing is there's no more buffets that everybody has to run to on Sunday mornings. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know how everybody's kind of jockeying to get out of church so they can get to the buffet first, so they get in line and get through first? Well, it dawned on me the other day, they're not operational anymore. John 19, verse 23. I'm going to introduce you to a Greek word. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and he made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, in one piece. The tunic is a word that is, is translating the Greek word kiton, kiton. Kiton is the undergarment. It is the garment that is worn close to the skin. In other words, it's underwear. So they took his robe, they took his outer garments, and then the soldiers took his underwear. It was one seamless gown, so to speak, that was underneath his robe. They took that, and they didn't divide that. They threw lots for that to see who would get that. And so Jesus then goes to the cross completely naked. And the reason that the Romans made 
prisoners go to the cross naked and then hang on the cross naked was so that his genitalia were at eye level of those watching. That's why they did it. So as to produce a death that was excruciating and excruciatingly painful excruciatingly long and excruciatingly shameful. They wanted him to be shamed. And so the loincloths we see on Jesus in paintings and in movies are really the result of people trying to sanitize the crucifixion with a little bit of civility and sanity, but there's nothing civil or sane or kind or gentle or nice or good about Jesus' death on behalf of sinners. So he goes to the cross completely naked before men and God and was like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, ashamed. Listen, Jesus went to the cross ashamed. Ashamed. Not because he had sinned. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he, God, who made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf. In other words, our sin was put on him so that we might become the righteousness of God. So he goes to the cross with our sin, and he goes with our shame. Not ashamed because he had sinned, but because of our sin, which God the Father had transferred him to pay for, to die for. So Jesus took all of our hateful thoughts, all of our harsh, cruel, and lying words, all of our adulterous glances, all of our infidelities, all of our cheating, all of our bitterness, and every other sin we have ever committed or ever will commit upon himself, so that we who believe and are trusting in him alone for our salvation are forgiven and thus can go free and live life guilt and shame free. Thus our sin, once transferred to Christ so that he paid for it, is no longer our sin. I don't know if you understand that. When you think of the cross, you've got to understand that. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, your sin became his sin. The blame for your sin, he took. The shame for your sin, he endured. That's what it required in order to save us so that we could go free. That means the guilt of our sin is no longer our guilt. The shame is no longer our shame. It all became his on the cross. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 2.24, And Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin. What he means by dying to sin so that we might die to it and everything it brings that we might go free. Hebrews 12, 2 makes it painfully clear. Jesus, for the joy set before him, the joy of glorifying his Father and in saving all who would come to him, endured the cross, despising the shame. You need to look at Hebrews 12, 2 sometime. He went despising the shame. He felt the shame. He felt your shame. And he despised it because he was going to pay for it. He, did, he did not allow it to stop him from finishing the work he came to do, which was to save us from our sins. And so there's only one place to hide where all of our sin is paid for and all of our guilt for our sin is removed and all of our shame is disarmed. And that place is in Christ who is our refuge and whose blood cleanses us completely from all sin and shame. And, and with his cleansing and with the removal of sin, there remains no guilt and no shame for us before God. I, I hope you understand. If you're a believer, there's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no sin. Because those things are tied to sin. And when sin is removed, they're gone. That's what the Bible says. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will not be put to shame. God's taken it away. So, so if you're in Christ today because you're trusting in him as your only savior from sin, you're no, longer, you're no longer clothed in your shame, but you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. 
And so you've left Genesis 3 and you have returned back to Genesis chapter 2 where you now stand naked and fully known before God and no longer need to be ashamed. You're fully exposed before him because your sin was fully exposed by Christ and he dealt with it all. But notice I said that if you're in Christ, you no longer need to be ashamed. So let's just close with this. What do you do, though, if you're a believer and you find yourself still struggling with shame? And you're struggling with shame from the past, which has long been forgiven. So I'm talking about true believers. If you're you're not a believer and you've got shame, you just need to run to the cross and get saved. Trust in Jesus. Give it to him. Believe in him and trust in him for salvation. If you're... that if you're not a believer, shame is driving you to the cross. If you are a believer and you're still struggling with shame over forgiven sin, it would help you to know that God promises that he will never shame the person who comes to him for salvation. Again, Romans 10, 13, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And again, the reason for this is that when Christ went to the cross as your substitute to bear God's condemnation for your sin and my sin, that our sin became his sin, our shame became his shame, and was fully exposed before God the Father in Christ. In other words, that which we fear the most, which is exposure, that's what most of us fear, that we're going to be exposed someday, that already happened. Your greatest fear has already come true. You don't got to worry about it. The full exposure for all your sinful choices and all my sinful choices, it's already happened. It happened at the cross. The thing that you're fearing is going to come one day, God says, it's not going to come. It already came when Jesus did it for you and took your exposure when he went naked to the cross. So when Christ went to the cross in your place, everything shameful about you and everything you're ashamed of was completely exposed in him and then punished by God the Father as though Jesus himself had done it. So in Christ, the truth about you has been uncovered. There's nothing to hide, nothing any longer to be ashamed of because in uncovering the truth about us, Jesus bore our shame and covered us with his righteousness as though our lives were lived as righteous as God himself. So remember that woman who met Jesus at the well? But once she met Jesus, he changed her heart. He took care of her sin, took care of her shame. And she, no longer filled with and controlled by shame, walked right back into that village that afternoon and started telling everyone what Jesus had done for her. She was no longer ashamed. You'll find her story in John 4. Read it sometime. It's a good story. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that we would go out of here as believers who recognize that our shame has been cared for. Our guilt has been taken care of. Our sin has been paid for by Jesus. And Father, I pray for those who may not know Christ, who are trusting in other things to deal with their shame, who are trying to produce good works that could hide it, or maybe they're just running from you in all manners of ways. I pray that you will intervene, that you will rescue them and bring them to yourself for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.